I'm standing here with Mary Lou Jobson, and we're here at the People Centered Internet, and she has been the architect of the one laptop per child, my favorite project of all times. And you were the architect. How long have you been working on this project? I started One Laptop Per Child with Nicholas Negroponte in early 2005. Yeah. And we got the first sample into production in less than two years and moved it into high volume mass production in less than three years. This is the thing everyone thought was impossible. Bill mm -hmm. Gates, Steve Jobs, Michael Dell. Intel. <laughs> Intel. <laughs> where I had been the CTO of the display division prior to that who said, oh, it'll never work. And you know what? It worked and it was a catalytic impact on the world. We now yeah, it was very inspirational. I mean, we had a, a that beautiful thing with the green ears and the the white laptop. I still have them. My children are still using them. How did it How did it uh, work out with this project? Because I mean, the, uh, how many millions? Uh, because I know that Nico Ponto said you need to buy a million as a government. You know, per every government needs to buy at least a million. But how how did it end That's up how this we project? Started. We got the first head of state, President Lula, in Brazil, to say he would get by two million for his country, and we thought we'd hit like. Different heads of state on each continent, yeah. every by a million or two, that would be our pilot run. Yeah. So we got Lulu to say yes, and every other head of state in Latin America called that weekend. I remember it was 4th of July weekend, <laughs> 2005, saying, what, are you kidding? Brazil represent Latin America? They were indignant. I mean, like, well... What's the problem? Talk to us. Talk to us about ourselves. We, 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 Brazil, yeah. like, what's the big deal? And they said prophetically they don't even speak Spanish oh, okay. and I thought oh, okay yeah, good point okay fine we'll take another one fine okay uh -huh. so we built this coalition uh, of, of heads of state that wanted to buy the laptops at cost made it a not-for-profit made it a charity and meanwhile I was pedaling hard as the only only employee of one laptop per child the only employee <laughs> Gosh, the $100 laptop, which I actually showed to President Lula and actually Kofi Annan then, the then head of the United Nations, yeah. uh, said, hey, why don't I unveil it on this at this um, UN summit on the digital divide, which was in early November, maybe it was late November, in Tunisia. And so we said, sure, <laughs> and I have that even harder to design that. And he unveiled it. It was a um, functional tethered prototype. And after that, I went to Asia and was able to sign up the largest manufacturers in the world who all thought it was ridiculous because they were listening. There was all this press around how impossible it was because, in fact, we ruined the business plans of some of the larger companies who felt if they lost a million seats in a country, they might lose that country forever. So you caused a lot of competition in those companies. And so rather than $2,000 or $1,000 for a laptop, we lowered the cost to by 10x, to 100 bucks. And that allowed access through a laptop. And yes, we love smartphones and all those things, but you know, it takes multiple hardware devices. Smartphones are still $800 and actually didn't really exist. The iPhone came out in early 2007. Those are great too, but laptops allow you to. Um, oh no! I I love the laptops. The right but now papers. move 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 <laughs> forward. Move forward. How many uh, how many of those one laptop per child have actually been produced in the end? Over 10 million children have been hit through the program, and then there were competing efforts. So we were catalytic impact. We designed it, especially coming out of M MIT. A lot of a lot of thought came from the more of the veterans of MIT about tenure and sort of can we create in some ways an anti-tenure organization where we're catalytic a bit how as we heard earlier this evening the Gates Foundation mm -hmm. wishes to be catalytic and so we decided you know we're just going to be that step function can we get industry to take it over by lowering the cost so dramatically they compete to save the world and it happened netbooks mm. became the fastest growing the competition to the hundred dollar laptop became the fastest growing compute consumer electronics category yeah. ever recorded mm -hmm. creating not only did a billion dollars of revenue through go through this not-for-profit creating new consumer electronics but 30 billion dollars of revenue was created for the for-profit partners some of whom the very organizations that initially had tried to Kill stop it. us yeah and, and now we're living in a world of 40 dollar tablets that are you think of 
Apple and Samsung as the big sellers of tablets, but in fact, the biggest seller are so-called white box, brandless tablets mm -hmm. that sell en masse to ministries of education throughout the world to enable low-cost computing devices for the children of those countries. Yeah. <laughs> so we won. It happened. <laughs> Yes. And what, is it, does it still exist, the organization? The organization still exists. because the reference designs or uh, what? To it focuses on education and content, which was always the goal. It was not a laptop project. It was no. an education project. And so we've solved that yeah. as a step function in how you does need it Internet, you need a device, and now the important stuff is coming. How and that's the improve education? Okay. So let's go to you again. And now you're, you left it, uh, You left after flying all over the place. You left that organization. Where do you work now? I recently joined Facebook, where I'm the executive director of engineering um, in Facebook and also the head of display technologies in Oculus for virtual reality, because I design high volume consumer electronics distinguished by often the screen and the opto electronics. And my PhD is in optics, and I worked as an multimedia artist for many years and I'm an electrical engineer and I was a computer science professor and I did a lot of different and is things. And that not a huge change to go from this non-profit catalytic organization to, to an organization which really wants to touch a billion people and want to change the virtual reality picture? Well, before that I founded Pixel Chi, which I went, I gave up my faculty position at MIT because I thought I was having more impact by sleeping on the factory floors of Asia to try to design much more innovative consumer electronics because I think there's a stigma, particularly for a professor or a PhD in Asia, mm -hmm. like they got the education so they didn't have to work in the factories. I grew up on a farm, I don't care, I'll sleep on the factory floors, like when there's a problem, I'll fix the problem. I find it interesting. If you don't understand how things are made and how decisions are made around how things are made, you can't make better more compelling things. Mm -hmm. So I did that, and then Sergey Brin, one of the co-founders of, of Google. I said, think I heard about him. Yeah. Said, hey, why don't you come help start Google X mm. and do some moonshots, you'd be amazing. And so Sergey came and really pulled me out of that with um, Megan Smith and Astrotel and other, other people. And so I went for Go to Google for a couple of years, and only recently this year, Mark Zuckerberg just made me this compelling offer to do programs. Let's that design the next uh, generation of virtual reality. And, and uh, beyond that, yeah. more moonshotty than Google X in terms of moonshot. Oh, we're going to have our, gonna have our brains. Good. We're going to have our brains directly connected into Facebook. No, no, yes, no, no, that no, would no, be no, great. Not that. But <laughs> things that Google X is a little scared about, Mark Zuckerberg was embracing. And I just, I just realized I could provide more value to Facebook than Google, but they're both great companies. I both, I, I really, really um, am so happy for the opportunity at Google. I didn't yeah. mean to like no, create no, any no, kind no, of, no, no, no. yeah. And we're going to see, you know, next year is going to be an exciting year eh, for uh, for you and for Facebook and for, for all these uh, VR. I'm working much more on the next generations because when I started at Facebook, I started about six months ago. The that generation's already baked. I think I'm much more interested in, in the ones that come. I've helped a little bit on those, but mostly I'm focused on the, the next generation. Yes, you can all talk about, I guess. They're much better. Yeah, they're much better. Yeah. <laughs> but they can you lift a little much further out, so you have to buy buy the stuff in, yeah, in ten years. In ten years, what, what will I what will I get? Or five years? What well, will I get in five years? Well in ten years Mark Zuckerberg has a clear vision. One billion people in VR in Facebook. <laughs> sharing and in presence and experience so we can all be with each other because it's not quite like how the internet is now so how do we actually it's the best way to experience presence mm -hmm. and so how do we have this experience you and i are having at this party tonight with fantastic brilliant people and how do we feel that even though we're all on the internet how do we feel more connected celebrate our humanity and part of that is virtual reality seems the best way to do that that we've been able to invent to date i'm looking forward to your 10-year project thank you very much and thank you thank for you. one laptop a child thank you